hey, do you design, build, run, architect a mission critical application for your organization? Well, good news. We have a new episode on the Azure Enablement Show that's just for you. Join us. Hey, so welcome back to another episode of the Azure Enablement Show. This time we're going to be talking about mission critical and what does it mean and how do you get started with it? So like we like to do with the Azure Enablement Show, let's take this from the customer's perspective. So let me switch to customer mode. Okay. Well, hey, Sebastian. Hey, Martin. Thank you so much for joining me today. So. Um, we have been in Azure for a bit, and we've done a good job of moving some applications to the cloud, and we're feeling pretty good about it, but we're just about to take on our main application, sort of the, like the, the business critical thing that we need to do. And I thought it might be good to figure out, like, does Microsoft have any way to help us uh, when we're dealing with something that is so mission, uh, dare I say, mission critical? Um, so um, I know there's something called mission critical at Microsoft. Um, can you just like give me the very basics of what that means to to Microsoft? Like what's what's mission critical? Um, yeah, what's mission critical for you folks? Sure, David. Yes. So maybe let's start by talking about yeah, what is mission critical, and because it can be very different for everyone. And let me start by saying it's different, especially from what people are used to on prem. Whether right? on prem, like if you have a super important application, what did you do? you threw a lot of hardware on the problem. Like you never touched it, like it's big servers in your basement and you never touch it and nothing happens to them. In the cloud, things become different, right? Like there's a multi-tenant system, things get updated all the time, things get changed all the time. So you need to design differently. You need to design with failure in mind. Like things can go wrong and eventually things will go wrong. And this is the first thing you always need to keep in mind when you talk about mission critical. So what we, what we mean by mission critical workloads are things that are super critical to your business. And there can be different things to different people. Like for me, it might be like, it's a financial loss if my application is not working. For you, it might be like, if your application is not working correctly, like you get a loss of rep reputation, right? So those things are different by for everyone. So you need to define for yourself what actually is mission critical for your business. Okay, so I, I get that. What's the difference then between the other set of guidance that I that I was looking at about, about well architected? Like what's the difference between mission critical and well architected? So Sebastian and I, we both work with customers like you, with uh, the most important and biggest customers who have uh, plenty of uh, mission critical workloads. And we realized that there is a lot of guidance in the Microsoft documentation. Uh, it's called uh, well architected framework which has all the necessary information that you need to build such workloads and build uh, good Azure applications. Uh, but what, it, uh, what was missing was the prescriptive guidance, something more opinionated uh, for someone with experience like our team has to come in and say, this is how it's supposed to be done for Azure mission critical applications. So how do you run applications on Azure which should never go down? So we put all of our experience, we put all the uh, important bits of well-architected framework and put them into this uh, guidance. So there are two important pieces of this guidance is the design me methodology and reference implementations. Because we are not just talking about it, we're not just telling you how to do it, we can also show you how to do it because we've implemented a, a sample, let's say, a reference for you to look into and uh, adopt. Okay, so I dig that. Can I see what that looks like? It's uh, all of it is open source and it's uh, up on the documentation. So on Microsoft Learn, uh, if you if you search for Azure Mission Critical, you will quickly find our uh, landing page for the documentation. It's divided uh, mainly into uh, design areas. So we are trying to follow the standard which was set uh, in uh, well architected framework and Azure landing zones. And we are, we are using the same uh, names for different areas. And then you can just go through either all of them one by one, or you can uh, focus on a specific area. You can take a look at networking and connectivity, for instance, and you can take a look and to read about uh, doing global traffic routing properly or what you need to consider for global load balancing and things like that. So that's the guidance part of it. Okay. 
Then you can find on Azure Architecture Center, you can find baseline architectures. We have multiple of those. Uh, we have the basic one, the online, then we have one with network controls and one connected to Azure Landing Zones. And the final piece is uh, a GitHub repo, actually a set of uh, GitHub repos, uh, which contain the source code of the reference implementations. And there you can really dig deep and you can take your developers and you can, you can show it to them and they can see, oh, this is how the Terraform implementation for that should be done. And this is how you code this particular thing in C-sharp. Uh, and so all the details can be found there. So every, we built everything in the open. So that's cool. And I really like the fact that I could just go grab stuff from GitHub and start working on this. I, I have to admit being a little unclear on the different kinds of reference architectures. Can we take a look at one of them, like preferably something that looks uh, like that I would get started with? Um, and, and, and so I could just see what those entail. Yeah, sure. Let's uh, take a look at the what we call the baseline reference implementation, right? So uh, what you can see here, a couple of building blocks. And we start by, by looking at the first building block at the top, which is called what we call the global, uh, global resources. So this building block contains all the resources that share the same life cycle and which are not dependent to any one Azure region. So this is very important. For example, our global load balancer. So in most cases, we recommend to use Azure front door. Uh, that's obviously not tied to an Azure region. We have Azure Container Registry in there, which we can deploy like an active, active uh, manner across many regions. And same is true for Cosmos DB, which we use as our data store. Uh, next to those, we have the global monitoring resources. Um, they again share a different life cycle, so they are in a different, uh, different category. Underneath them, uh, that's where we look at the, at the actual workload resources, what we call the regional stamps. So in the most simple terms, one Azure region can equal one stamp, but it could also have multiple stamps per region. And what you notice is that every stamp looks exactly the same, right? So every region gets the same set of resources and they don't share anything. That's very important. We don't want any interdependencies between uh, any two stamps because that would create single point of failures. Whereas here, like uh, the idea is if any a uh, stem fails, be that because any one re a service in a region fails or because an entire region goes down, this does not impact any of the other stamps that you still have remaining. The only way we synchronize between the stamps is through the backend data store and of course through the load balancer, which sends traffic to each region. Okay, cool. Can I, can I ask a couple of questions about what I'm seeing here? Sure, go ahead. Uh, the first thing is why front door instead of traffic manager? Because sometimes we've, we've used traffic manager in the past. We've used some Azure front door, but why one over the other? Yeah, good good question that we often get because yeah, so traffic manager has been around for, for much longer and has been used in many scenarios. And there's still a good place for traffic manager. But for any scenario that's a HTTP based workload, we highly recommend to go with front door just because there's a, a it has a lot of added features like integrated web application firewalling, like edge caching, and because it's also it's more transparent failover, whereas like uh, Traffic Manager, which is DNS-based, the failover decision in the end depends on the client. You have like things like DNS timeouts and things like that. Okay, so my second question is, I'm seeing two different, I guess you called them stamps or you know, and they're regions here. Um, and are they both alive at the same time? Is this active active? Is this, is, is, are you suggesting that there's, there's a primary and a secondary? What, what's, what's the guidance for, the, for this particular architecture? Yes, so this is a very good observation. Uh, our guidance for mission critical applications is to run active active uh, configuration as much as possible, if possible. So that's why every stamp is capable of handling requests coming to it. And they are synchronized through the shared data store, which in our case is globally distributed Cosmos DB. So every region which contains a stamp also contains a Cosmos DB endpoint. Uh, we are using multi-region write setup. So then every region writes to its own endpoint for maximum performance. But if one of the regions goes down, then that's where we are using the front doors, let's say speed of realizing uh -huh. that it's not working and uh, flipping traffic to the still working region. Okay, I know I said I had two questions, but I actually have at least at least three, um, because the more we get into this, the more interesting this gets. Um, 
Okay, so I'm seeing some stuff on the left that's uh, on the left that we didn't talk about that you didn't point at, which is GitHub um, and Azure pipelines. Um, why is that on the diagram? Yeah. So uh, the reason they are not in the box is because they they are not tied to the same lifecycle, the, the runtime dependency of the of the actual application, right? But on the other hand, they are super important to make your application vision critical as well. In order to be able to, to run a super critical app, you need to have everything automated. And that's one of the key principles that we follow in, in the guidance as well. Like everything should be automated. Like there should be no manual steps in there. Like everything should be, uh, you should be able to deploy that thing from scratch. Uh, and of course, that's what we use a CI CD tool for. So we're proposing Azure DevOps here uh, for the or Azure pipelines. But this is one part where we're not super opinionated. Like if your company uses like a different tool and you're familiar with a different pipeline tool, then by all means, go ahead. But it's always important to remember that it should be in place there. Okay. And I, so I get the automated part. Is there so, so, let, so let's just talk about what happens on day two. Let's say it's time to update something. Um, am I going to like do a rolling update where I, where I update one region or one stamp and then I update another stamp? Like how, how long do the stamps stick around? Um, am I expected to keep them up to date? What happens when they come out of SKU? Like how do you handle that situation? One of the principles we didn't mention yet is that uh, every stamp is ephemeral, which means that it can go away at any time and the application should still work. So we are uh, constantly redeploying and removing stamps uh, while the application is still working and everything is defined as code. So this is a really very quick and easy to do. And the side effect of this is that we can do very easily blue-green deployments where we actually take a new version, we deploy it as a whole new stamp and we don't deploy independently just infrastructure or just parts of the application. We take the whole thing, uh, whatever is in a, in a branch or in the repository at that time, and we, we deploy that as a new stamp. And then we configure front door to add this new stamp as a new backend with uh, zero traffic. And then we add traffic to it gradually uh, while testing that it still works. And eventually, when it's confirmed that this new stamp is fully working, fully operational, there are no bugs, nothing which would uh, even hinder performance, uh, then we remove the old stamp completely. So there's point in time during these updates where you're running basically two versions, uh, two different versions of the stamps at the same time until you're fully uh, happy that the new one works. If the new one doesn't work properly, you can always switch back uh, to yeah. the old and just destroy it. Okay, so that that makes sense. Um, uh, another question I guess I have here is we're looking at production, right? But like I don't have just production. Uh, you know, we have dev environments, we have staging environments. How does that all wrap into what we're what mission critical? Yeah, good point. So a key point about mission critical is that by the time you deploy to production you should have very high confidence that what you're going to deploy there will actually work there, right? And so in order to get there, uh, what we propose is to have all your non-prod environments being like non-prod, UAT, dev, test, whatever you want to call them, they look exactly like prod. Of course, they don't look exactly like prod because you might not run in that, like a dev, a dev system in like five regions, but you should still use the exact same architecture that you see here maybe with just one stamp. And instead of like 20 nodes in your Kubernetes cluster, you just run one or two nodes in a very low skew, right? But still the architecture looks exactly the same. So as much as possible, you should not share things between like different environments, which you also wouldn't do in prod. And still like all the components should be there because that's what the cloud enables you, right? Even your dev environment can get a full-fledged front door and a full-fledged AKS cluster. It's just a bit smaller than your production workload. But by doing this, you know that by the time you deploy to production, that it, that your new changes will work there because you've tested them already on something that looks very much like production. Okay, well, I appreciate that. That's certainly my intent, right? But but my experience is is yes. Um, the vast majority of the time, the things that we are ready to go to production with work, but sometimes they don't. And so one of the things that I'm really interested in is um, in this sort of situation, 
uh, how do I monitor to make sure things are going okay, right? Because it looks like there's one global monitoring thing in that picture. Um, how does monitoring work in a mission critical world? Let's take a look at the picture again, and I will show you all the various monitoring resources uh, we have. So there's definitely the global one. So we have a resource group for global monitoring, and okay. that uh, handles monitoring for Cosmos and Front Door and the global resources. But then also each stamp has its own monitoring resources. Uh, we are using Application Insights together with Log Analytics, and we store every all the logs, all metrics, or application uh, logging and monitoring into those separate uh, stamp divided uh, resources, monitoring resources. Uh, we have implemented end-to-end -end tracing. So when you receive a request from your end user on your web uh, application, you're actually able to go to Application Insights and see it all the way uh, to the cluster, to Event Hub, to the cluster again, and to a database. And uh, if something goes wrong, your end user can just provide you with correlation ID, and you're actually able to track down what exactly went wrong and at which place. And the reason why these are separate, why each uh, stamp has its own monitoring resources, mm -hmm. is that we don't want to create single points of failure. So if one stamp goes down, we don't want to rely on that particular stamp uh, for all monitoring. So that's why every stamp has its own. They also have their individual life cycles. So if a stamp is recycled or removed and recreated because they're ephemeral, like I said earlier, right. uh, we still keep the monitoring resources around because we might want to take a look back at the logs from the previous stamp uh, or investigate uh, something in there. So that's why they, are, they have even like a separate life cycle. Okay, so I have my very last question. This is the this is I think you call this the baseline, right? This is where people start from. Um, my world is a little more complex than this in that, uh, you know, I don't necessarily control or run everything in my organization. Um, are there reference architectures for that more more complex case? Um, and if so, could we take a look at them? I don't know, maybe maybe another time. Yes, let's do so. So yes, as Martin mentioned earlier, we have like a couple of more reference implementations which cater exactly for those scenarios. Like one, for example, is, uh, is specific to the implementation or integration in a landing zone environment, right? So if you're a big organization, your organization might already apply landing zones and that's where that reference implementation comes into play. So sure, let's meet back to, to look at that one. Yeah, I'd really like to look at it. Well, well, given that, I just want to thank both of you. Um, and I want to thank, uh, and I think I should switch back to host mode now. OK, back to being a host. So I just want to thank you, Sebastian. I want to thank you, Martin. I want to thank everybody for watching this. Please join us again on the next episode of the Azure Enablement Show. <laughs> <laughs>